the beginning of our traditions, the beginning of our mythologies, our histories, our chronological systems, they all begin with the ending of a previous world for which we have very, very little records. The year was 3895 BC. A pole shift caused by the Phoenix phenomenon totally, totally destroyed the world. The civilizations that were here were buried in cataclysms, in mud floods, in mud rains from the sky. Volcanic resurfacing and subsidence. Oceans slipped their basins. The destruction was so total on earth and in the sky that the survivors truly believed that it was that a whole new heavens and a new earth had been born. The Phoenix Pole Shift began year one of the of the reset calendar, the Annus Mundi calendar, which was studied in ancient Egypt in the famous Alexandrian Library under the Ptolemies. The Annus Mundi system has been used consistently by the Rosicrucians and the Masons in their own own documents, and we have revealed this in Chronicon in many of our, our videos. The Annus Mundi system was known by Eratosthenes and Anaximander and several of the scholars that, that lived in ancient Egypt but were, Macedon, uh, were of Macedonian descent. Year one of this calendar began the vapor canopy. The total, the sky had changed. The ocean basins had changed. Had, 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 Nothing was, nothing was recognizable anymore. The cities were gone. People were scattered. And this began a 456-year dark age. This dark age is very little known. It is recorded in the book of Genesis. It is a part of the 1,656 years of the pre-flood world. Very little records other than Jewish fable, Jewish tradition have been interpolated into this period, such as in the year 3880 BC, which is fifth, the year 15 after pole shift, Cain slays his twin brother Abel. We don't, we don't believe that this is an actual historical occurrence, but it actually masks something else. In the year 130, Seth is born, firstborn of, Ad, of Adam of the Sethite lineage. <clears throat> but the children of Seth, is a borrowing. The ancient Hebrews borrowed this from the Egyptians. The children of Set was in, were, were identified in ancient Egypt as being related to the Typhon, the great sky dragon that destroys civilizations. In ancient Egypt, the children of Set had appeared on the world scene just after a vast destruction. And in the, he in the Hebrew tradition, it's now Seth giving, giving birth to a race of people, himself being descended from Adam, which in the Babylonian writings we know was Adamu, was a race of people, not a pronoun, not a person. <clears throat> we, have we have the Phoenix phenomenon returning in 3757 BC, which was the year 138 Annus Mundi, but we have no records of what happened. This was a period of illiteracy. There are no records, written records from this period. We do have a tradition that's very interesting. That in the year 170, after pole shift, Seth begins to rule at 40 years old, starting the Sethite dynasty of Egypt. And in this tradition, we find that by the year 280, which is 3615 B.C., men begin to lose faith in the Eternal One. 280 years, nothing has changed since the pole shift. Men begin to lose faith in the Eternal One, but in the Japanese myth of Amaterusa, the goddess, we find it interesting that in the seventh generation of the gods, people begin to rebel against the goddess. This is in the Japanese tradition. But the, the number 280 is seven generations. It's 40 times seven. So we have some cor we have a correlate here between ancient Hebrew writings of the Haggadah and a Japanese tradition, which is very interesting. Then in 365 AM, Canaan begins ruling the Sethite dynasty. And in the year 3499, 
BC, which was 396 years after the pole shift cataclysm of the Phoenix phenomenon, Nemesis X object enters the inner solar system. Right after that, it's followed by the Phoenix phenomenon again, but we have no records of it. It was the year 414 Annus Mundi. And in the Chinese tradition, we have 3468 BC as the birth of the Chinese prophet Fu Qi. And many biblical scholars and even the Chinese themselves claim that this is none other than the Enoch of the Bible. But in the year 456, something strange happened. In our calendar, it was 3439 BC. Nemesis X object passes really close to us again as it exits the system. In this year appear the Watchers in the Hebraic and Judaic traditions. But in the Sumerian tradition, this began the 432,000 days of the Great Flood, the Shars, or turnings of the heavens. Because in the vapor canopy, the only thing that was counted was the turning of the, turnings of the stars. And the stars were considered kings. And this is where the Sumerians got the concept of calling a king a Shar, like Shargon of Akkad. Zechariah Sitchin has completely corrupted the translation, but he's not the only one guilty of that. Eudoxus corrected it over 2,300 years ago, but no one listened to him. They instead followed Plato and his translations of ancient texts and the borrowings, considering that numbers of lunar lunations and days were actually years, which were creating fantastic chronologies that went back hundreds of thousands of years of time, which is absolutely ridiculous. But we don't need to beat that horse. I've already had many videos on that. But this was 3439 BC and the Anunnaki appeared. And suddenly there's civilization everywhere. An infrastructure fully intact appears on the scene. Cities are built. Sumerian King List is very specific about the, the Sumerian Pentopolis. It names all five cities, huge metropolitan areas, full, multicultural, all kinds of people. We see the evidence in, in the Mohenjo-Daro and Larak, uh, the, the uh, Harappan Valley civilization. They seem to be older than the Sumerian cities. This begins the technolithic civilization in the historical record otherwise known as the contact period. Suddenly, Neolithic man is, is catapulted straight into civilized behaviors, civilized institutions, the art of writing, of recording time and calendars on the Kwipu. All these things are introduced in the cereals, the kind. Dogs are domesticated in hundreds of breeds. Everything explodes onto the world scene that Neolithic man had never seen before. And the matriarchal governments that are set up all around a smooth skin, dark skin, dark eyed, dark eyed people, dark haired people are suddenly confronted with a patriarchal system of, uh, of people who have advanced technology and they have their infrastructure intact. They have, they have their traditions, they have their memories. And the problem we have in putting all this together is people like Zechariah Sitchin and his ilk who have passed on erro erroneous information and conveyed that the Sumerians were conveying things that they had actually seen and not things that they had heard. The frames of reference for the ancient world are given to us in primitive form because they were recorded centuries after the events they depict. Had the events been recorded at the time of occurrence, they would have been closer to our frames of reference. We live in a technologically advanced civilization and we can interpret things you know, by those frames of reference. But instead, passed down to us are, are seemingly silly fables and stories and miraculous things. But when taken into their proper context, we understand that we are reading about ancient technologies at work being performed in the presence of people who did not understand them. Suddenly, with the appearance of these bearded strangers from the sea who arrived on ships, now all of a sudden, Enoch is born. Enoch goes into a full ministry, Enoch being the Enki of the Sumerian records. The Olmec calendar 
comes into being. Very sophisticated arithmetic. But not only the Olmec calendar, then the Mayan calendar comes into existence. The Vedic calendars come into exi existence. Enoch begins a prophetic ministry against the Nephilim and the giants in the year 3233 B.C. Enoch then, in 3208 B.C., which was 687 years after the pole shift, Enoch becomes king of the Sethite dynasty. His son is Methuselah. Now, these are the records that have been passed down to us. It does not mean they actually happened in this way. Much of this is Hebraicized versions of secular events that they culled from other sources. But we're told that in the year 3195 BC, which was exactly the year 700 after the cataclysm, Adam revealed to Seth that the great flood would destroy the world. This is interesting because in 3895 BC, the new heavens and new earth were created by a pole shift, which was, which was caused by the Phoenix phenomenon. The entire duration of the pre-flood world to the flood being 1656 years is divisible by 138, which is the Phoenix periodicity. And as we know from so many so many chapters in all my books and all my posts and all my videos, that the great flood popularly known as the Flood of Noah, was also caused by the Phoenix Phenomenon in the year 2239 B.C. in the month of May. Now, in 3165, Cain is now killed by accident. I believe it was a hunting accident by one of the Sethites. In 3163 B.C., Newgrange, Stonehenge 1, and other megalithic monuments are erected by the Sethites. They are found in the United Kingdom today. In th in which, which also I need to point out, the Sumerian records, all the histories we find in the Sumerian and Akkadian texts about the, about the people f before the flood and, and shortly after, those histories were taken from somewhere else. They did not occur in the Near East. The geographical names, the geological features of, 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 that, that, are, that are mentioned in all these ancient Sumerian texts and tablets do not comport with anything that is in the Near East. The cities of, of metallurgy and the mining, the mining camps and districts that are mentioned in Sumerian records could not be in the, in the Near East. There are no mountains that have metals and ores in the, in the Near East. The, the civilization was closer to the circumpolar stars, which would be the, around the United Kingdom area, not the Near East. But anyway, Enoch becomes an emperor over 130 kings and priests in the year 3151 BC, which was 744 years after the cataclysm. Then, the Maya It's a Temple of the Cross calendar begins. This begins in Mayan tradition with the birth of, of the Maya Lady Beast. This was a very important matriarch of the pre-flood world. She is remembered as spider grandmother in many ancient American traditions. 3113 BC, the Mayan long count calendar begins and Stonehenge 2 is carried out. This is the second layering of the Stonehenge complex. But in this year also, which began the Mayan long count, was a series of meteoritic and comet impacts that totally destroyed North America. One, specific, one particularly giant asteroid colliding into what is now the present day United States and Canada. And in 3103 BC, the Vedic Kali Yuga calendar begins the Black Age of Kali. We have dated to this period, 3100 BC, the scholarly and post start date of the Narmer of Egypt, which is a memory of Enoch. And in 2965 BC, which is really interesting, it's 930 years after the pole shift cataclysm, Adam dies and the sun darkens. Adam, on his deathbed, prophesies of the coming Savior, the Sashuant, who is going to come and save mankind. 2944 BC, which is only 21 years later, is the official Chinese date for the life of Fuhi, an oriental Noah. And in 2921 BC, Enoch's daughter, Nama, is born. She will be the future wife of Noah, survivor of the flood. 
and in 2909 BC, 986 years after the pole shift, strange dreams of apocalypse and flood haunt the people and Enoch holds a council. Enoch received the divine instructions from God on how to build the Great Pyramid. But he never built it. He left those to, to the architects of the Sethites. And in 2908, Enoch ascended into the sky and vanishes at a sacred place called Akuzan, which we know as Giza. In the year 2905 BC, which was 990 Annus Mundi, the Sethites lay out the foundation for the Great Pyramid in Giza Complex. The Sphinx is sculpted out of living rock, and it is not a lion. It is a gigantic dog. 2870 BC is the Egyptian Coptic record, record that states that this is the founding of the Great Pyramid. Very, very close to what we have. 2853 B.C., Seth dies in the 52nd year of the Great Pyramid construction. According to the Hebrew text, he is 912 years old, living under the vapor canopy. 2852 is the Chinese claim a prophet taught writing in this year, and the people became literate. 2844 B.C., the Egyptian Coptic records claim that this also was the, the year that the Great Pyramid was built. This is all very, very similar. These are secular historical records that are basically comporting what we have found in, in our own studies in archaics for the building of the Great Pyramid. The Egyptian Coptic record claims it was that, that uh, this was when the Great Pyramid was built, and, and they're right, because this was technically the 62nd year of the construction. It took 90 years to build. In 2839 B.C., 1,056 years after the cataclysm, Noah is born during the start of the Anunnaki dynasty over the Sethites. He is the first generation progeny of the Anuna. Noah is a hybrid. In 2829 B.C., the Nephilim dynasty over the Sethites begins with al -Agagar. 2815 B.C., which was the year 1080 Annus Mundi, the Great Pyramid is complete with no capstone. And in 2778 B.C., we have the start date for the Egyptian short chronology. 2750 B.C. is the approximate date the Egyptologists assigned the completion of the Great Pyramid. That's pretty interesting. They're very close. 2729 B.C. King Enmenluana ascends the throne of the Nephilim dynasty seated at Bad Tabira, the metallurg city of metallurgy. 2713 B.C. is the first Bacton of 144,000 days complete of the Mayan long count. And in 2699 B.C., the traditional beginning of Chinese civilization. But with the year 2647 B.C., something unusual happens. Nemesis X object reappears under the, under the vapor canopy, under the vapor canopy world. When it reappears, we, this begins the post-technolithic period. I call this the shock and abandonment period because a significant population of the world called Anuna vanished. In 2609 BC, King Enmel Galana ascends the throne as the third of the Nephilim dynasty of Bad Tabira. And in this year, the interior of the Great Pyramid is explored for subsidence damage. Possible items and mechanisms are removed in this year. In 2529 BC, Bimuzi becomes the fourth king of the Nephilim dynasty at Bad Tabira. Humans are on their own. The Anuna have vanished. In 2473 BC, Jared died at the age, according to the Hebrews, of 962. He was the father of Enoch. And in 2446 B.C., it was 1,449 years 
after the cataclysm, a five-planet alignment of Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn occurred, according to the Chinese, 207 years before the Great Flood. And in 2429 BC, King Incipiziana becomes the fifth of the Nephilim dynasty at the city of Larak. In 2359 BC, Noah receives a sign that the flood is going to occur in 120 years. In 2357 BC, which is only two years later, we have the first year of Emperor Yao of China in the Chinese tradition. In 2349 BC, King Enmendarana becomes the sixth king of the Nephilim dynasty at Sippar. In 2341 BC, in the 1,554 years after the Phoenix pole shift cataclysm that, that began a new heavens and new earth, Noah married the daughter of Enoch named Nama. In 2339 BC, Japheth was born to Noah and Nama. In 2338 BC, Ham was born to Noah and Nama. In 2337 BC, Shem was born to Noah and Nama. In 2335 BC, the Sumerian king list dating of Etana, Enoch, to the flood is at this time. This is a scholarly date. It's not bad for something that happened 5,000 years ago. It's only 96 years off. 2325 BC is Manathos dating for Thoth, who is also Enoch, the scribe of the gods to the disaster of the flood. It is 86 years off. That's pretty good. In 2313 BC is the second Mayan Bactin is complete of the Mayan long count. It is now 288,000 days. This, excuse me, this is a period that's also found in the Vedic text, 288,000 years, which we know was an error. In the year 2309 BC, the pre-flood apocalypse begins, starting with the giant wars. In 2291 BC, the seventh king of the Nephilim dynasty ascends the throne. His name is Ubar Tutu at the city of Shurapak. For those of you who know your Near Eastern histories, you will know that in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the survivor of the flood was named Napishtim, and Gilgamesh went and talked to Napishtim while he was an old man but still alive after the flood. And he found out from Napishtim that it was at the city of Shurapak that Napishtim had received a vision to build the ark so he could survive the flood. In 2283 BC, the Egyptian Coptic record claims that in this year, the writings on the Great Pyramid were copied and preserved by the people. This is a very ancient tradition that the Great Pyramid was once covered in holy writings and symbols. Whole libraries and archives were upon its surfaces, and that these were translated and put into tablets in the days of Abraham. They became the core, the core religious and, and scientific material that appeared in the, in the books of the ancient world. This is also the subject matter of my book, The Lost Scriptures of Giza. 2254 BC is the traditional date for the Chinese flood. It's pretty good. It's only 15 years off. 2244 BC, Lamech, the father of Noah, he dies, according to the Hebrews, at 777 years old. And Noah begins in this year to build the ark. In 2239 BC, the year 1656 of Genesis, since the vapor canopy appeared when the new heavens and new earth appeared the last time Phoenix destroyed the world, the Phoenix phenomenon returns again and causes a collapse of the vapor canopy. We know this collapse as the Great Flood. Every civilization in the world is reset. It collapses. Over 40 ancient writers, inscriptions, chronologists, and, and even a scientific panel in 1998 confirmed that 2240 to 2239, all within that year, what, that this disaster occurred. This began the Heliolithic period. The reason we in Archaics call this the Heliolithic period is because Everything then be, became, became focused on the sun. 
Calendars began recording the movements of the sun. The moon and the stars were no longer important. The vapor canopy had collapsed. The sun became the most dominant thing in the sky. We no longer had a violet sky. We had a blue sky full of clouds, which was something we had never seen before. And as soon as the waters of the flood began receding and the, no, the, the polar extremities had frozen solid, killing hundreds of millions of flora and fauna, we have a world thawing out and getting burned near the equator by the sun. And, peop and whole religions and theologies and cults began worshiping the sun as a god. It was noticed that it did provide light. It did help plants grow. It did, it did bring warmth, you know, in a freezing cold world. But the calendar, but the dating of the flood is very, very, very close by all these ancient traditions. Just like the Roman historian Marcus Varro, who dated the flood at, at about approximately 2200 BC, which is the year 1695 Annus Mundi. The date of the flood, according to the Frisian text, the Oralind manuscript, was 2194 B.C. Very, very close. The Toltec date of the flood, according to the historian Ishtar was 2179 B.C. Again, this is very, very close. It's, uh, the Ch it's also very close to 2137 B.C., which was the, the Chinese date for the sun darkening, which is interesting because... All the flood traditions that I have found and that Frank Joseph has found and, and published in his books also mention that prior to the great flood, the sky had, had darkened severely, more so than it normally, normally would. But we have the second reset known as the great flood. It is this reset that brings us closer into contact with civilizations and histories that are more comprehensible to us, that we, that we better understand. It's at this time that the Sumerians emerge. And yet the writing of things that happen pre-cataclysm, their own frames of reference are uh, over a century after a technologically advanced civilization had disappeared in a cataclysm. So they seem to be very simplistic to us, even cartoonish. But, but is not, they're not. They're conveying very advanced things, just like the Vedic texts. The, the, the older Sanskrit writings are conveying highly advanced technological materials. And sometimes it's, it's very obvious. Other times, not so. When the Aryans departed and left behind Dravidian culture, the Dravidians and local, local people of India had developed Hinduism. Hinduism did not come directly from the Vedas and the Sanskrit. Hinduism was a later development where many cultural attachments and imagination had been introduced into the older Aryan Sanskrit ideas and texts. So it's this, the same thing happened with the biblical materials. The Akkadians interpolated many things in the Sumerian text that really didn't belong there, just as the Babylonians had completely contorted everything the Akkadians had recorded. Then came in the Amorites, and they put it all back together. But their own frames of references, because the Amorites were highly intelligent, they were the Amuru, they were the Westerners. They were basically the Caucasians of the Near Eastern world. And when they entered the world scene, uh, in 1800 BC, they had taken over Babylon and, and Mari and Ugarit and Byblos in Syria, and they had put all this back together, and much of the Amorite writings became what you know of as the Old Testament Bible today. But the problem with understanding the pre-flood world is one of frames of reference. We interpret things from a very technologically advanced perspective. But the people who recorded the events of the ancient world, the building of the Great Pyramid and Stonehenge and, and Newgrange and the origin of all these calendars, these people didn't have those frames of reference. They had already lost everything. They did not understand technology. They didn't understand advanced applied mathematics. They didn't understand anything other than getting up in the morning, finding food, taking care of their animals, taking care of their families, defending their families, and doing it all the same day and being a part of a larger a larger family called a village or a community they were living in, in a neolithic period and they had lost every aspect of their infrastructure through resets so we can't blame them for not conveying the information as uh, uh, 
in the way that we would like it presented. But we have put back the pieces and we, we now pretty much understand that 3895 BC, BC new heavens and new earth was because a former civilization and world was totally destroyed. And the pre-flood world was a second creation. So when the great flood occurred, we're now in a third age. Which leads us to another cataclysm. The Ogygian Deluge of 1687 BC. It was also a Phoenix Cataclysm. But it's one that will require a whole nother series of videos. Hi, this is Jason. This is our second Archaics 2.0 video concerning the chronology of the ancient world. For those of you who do not know, Archaics is an acronym for Advanced Research of Chronological History of Artificial Intelligence X. And for those who need it, we have the Archaics timeline of the ancient world, the 337 PDF charts, all, all our chronological studies, and a PDF before the flood, a chronology was showing source materials on much of the data that we're going to reveal in this and in, in coming videos. You can find these in the links below. In our prior video, 22 chronological data points produced this chart. This chart exhibits the 600-year Anunnaki Nur period, going forward and backward in time from the birth or the historically recorded birth of Noah. In this video, we're going to be adding a lot more data points and expanding upon this chart. William Henson, in the book Discovering Ancient Giants, wrote concerning the Sumerian histories, quote, in text after text, whenever the starting point was recalled, it was always this, 432,000 years before the deluge, the Dengir, or the gods, came to earth. 432,000 is a number appearing in mythological systems around the world, according to Giorgio de Santinia and Hertha von Deschon in the famous epic work, Hamlet's Mill. In many of my videos, we have covered this 1,200-year period from the descent of the Watchers in 3439 B.C. to the Great Flood in 2239 B.C., which is exactly 432,000 days on the older Draconian calendar of 360 days a year. The precise amount of days that misinterpretation into years has several modern authors claiming that the Anunnaki descended 432,000 years before the flood. A ridiculous duration because nothing that happened half a million years ago would ever be relevant to history after so long a span. 3439 BC has the appearance of Enki as the head of the Anunnaki, who are described as descending from either a mountain or the sky itself. But in the Genesis narrative, at the same time, appears Enoch, the son of Jared, whose name is from an ancient Semitic root, meaning to descend. Babylonian historians wrote that the ten kings of the pre-flood world ruled 432,000 shars. Early Arabians believed that they had an ancestor king before the flood who lived 1,200 years exactly. He was King Shed Bedan Ad, the founder of civilization. The ten kings are associated by many with the ten patriarchs of the Genesis text from Adam to Noah before the flood. The Babylonian Historian Barosus claimed that the ten kings ruled for ten shars, or 1,200 years. That means that a shar was believed to be 120 years. The shar concept is preserved in Genesis where we learn that Noah was warned 120 years before the deluge was going to transpire. The biblical Noah meets his parallel in the Phoenician Aronos, the Greek Uranos. According to the 10th century B.C. historian Sanguniathan, Noah was the son of Adathon. In Plato's writings, this same Adathon was one of the ten kings of Atlantis, a realm that was destroyed utterly by a flood cataclysm. 
The Ten Kings figure prominently on some versions of the Sumerian king list. And those of you who have watched my Anunophiles videos, you know that the motif of the Ten Kings is an element of the apocalypse as well. The Genesis chronology has the Great Flood happening in the 1656th year. And Augustine, over 15 centuries ago, has the flood occurring in the year 1656 in his epic book, The City of God, Book 15. The dating of the Deluge in the year 1656 aligns perfectly with the Phoenix chronology in my book, When the Sun Darkens, published in 2009, which matches the Book of Jasher chronology having the Great Flood also in the 1656th year. We already established in the prior video that this was 2239 BC of our modern calendar. A Chinese tradition dates the flood at 2240 with a great object falling from the sky, according to Survivors of Atlantis, page 63, by the author and researcher Frank Joseph, who I highly admire. Also, Bruce Massey, American environmental archaeologist with the U.S. Air Force, revealed in the year 1998 that a series of cosmic impacts occurred about 2240 B.C. And oceanographer studies reveal a long, stable climate that was suddenly interrupted circa 2200 B.C., as published also by Frank Joseph. Further, French scientists in the Middle East discovered calcite deposits indicating a major impact around 2200 BC. This is found in Atlantis and the kingdom of the Neanderthals. This means 2239 BC, the 1200th year from 3439 BC, the appearance of the Watchers, was indeed the date of an epic cataclysm. Charles Piazzi Smith in the year 1880, Astronomer Royal of Scotland, determined that the descending passage of the Great Pyramid of Giza marked attention to the ancient pole star Alpha Draconis, otherwise known as the Eye of the Dragon, for the year 3440 BC. This is in the Great Pyramid by Smith on page 370. Very interesting aside. This book was already over a hundred years old when I happened upon it inside a Texas prison. This was later confirmed by engineer David Davidson in the year 1924. As an approximate only one year off, this is a scientific bullseye. The calendrical significance of the Great Pyramid of Giza is further detected in the following fact. Engineer and author David Davidson in 1926 published that the Great Pyramid's geometry recorded a calendar that began in the year 4040 BC and ends in the year of our calendar 2045 AD. This is in the Great Pyramid is divine message. This too is an approximate and it is only one year off from the true date of 4039 BC, which was exactly 600 years before the arrival of the Anunnaki in 34-39 BC. 120 years ago, a very little known researcher and author was putting out amazing research concerning what he called the Capture Flood, a period of time in a preliterate period when the moon first appeared during a cataclysm. He cites many traditions. Much of his research was derived from the even more obscure Aus Austrian researcher Hans Horberger. The man in question who wrote these books is named Hans Bellamy, and he is cited thoroughly by Emmanuel Velikovsky in his own researches in Worlds of Collision and, and Ages in Chaos. Hans Bellamy thoroughly documented the mechanism by which the, the capture flood occurred the moon captured in Earth's gravity and remaining here causing a cataclysm. It is the Anunnaki Nur 600 year epic calendar that gives us the date when this occurred. And in the Sumerian records we find that it was at the appearance of the moon too that a new branch of Anunnaki appeared called the Igigi. Akkadian texts and the Egyptian Turin Papyrus have the moon existing before the sun. Ancient American traditions have Venus existing before the sun, and this is mentioned in the 1870s by Gerald Massey in his lectures. 
This is because the vapor canopy hid the sun by day, but magnified Venus and the stars at night. The sun was born when the vapor canopy collapsed, known as the Great Flood. This was the birth of the sun. It began all the dynasties called Children of the Sun. The Sumerian records hold that when the Anunnaki arrived, they found the sky covered in a dense cloud co cover. The text reads, daylight did not shine, moonlight had not yet emerged. The ancient Near Eastern tablets translated by Dr. Malachi York in the Holy Tablets, a gigantic book, monumental research. It took me a long time to read this, but he mentions specifically that the end of a 600 year period, the Anunnaki created mankind. This is in Shabbat, page 99, column 1, and section 471 through 74 on page 173, column 1. Let me reiterate, what we have here is a scholar of Near Eastern Antiquities admitting that he found in a text a reference to a 600 year period involving the Anunnaki. 4039 BC is 144 years, a golden proportion number, before the year 3895 BC, which was year one, of the pre-flood world's calendar, established in ancient chronological systems. Here we have a glimpse into a very profound mystery. Was there a period of paradise where humanity was protected in a walled enclosure and taken care of by the gods? In Genesis year one, our 3895 BC, it marked mankind's curse and banishment from Eden, which was the 144th year since 4039 BC when the Anunnaki arrived via the moon. We, cannot, we, can, we just can't ignore the Kabbalistic tradition either that Adam was assigned the number 144. This can be found in the book The Knights Templar in the New World on page 125. But even more so, in Gematria, Adam is Adum, A-D-M, or 1440. But zero has no placement value, thus Adam is 144. A fact mentioned in the very enigmatic text, the Rosicrucian Cosmo Connection, on page 500. Another very large book that took me a while to get through. Further, the very first verse in the Bible, the first phrase in the book of Genesis is in the beginning, but it has a root containing Kedem, which has a geometrical value of 144, but it carries with it the idea of something that is eternal. And according to Bonnie Gaunt, beginnings, beginnings, the sacred design, this is the very first thought in the sacred writ. So counting yet another 600 years backward through history gets us to the year 4639 BC. So far before the historical record that we cannot know anything about this date other than its connection to the Anunnaki. But this date is inferred in the Vedic system. In Vedic system, the fourth age was 432,000 years in a calendar that had the stellar sphere moving one degree in 6,000 years, according to the old book, Zadkiel's Legacy, on page 41. The mechanics here is not important, nor is it accurate, but the preservation of these numbers is paramount to our study. These four ages are 216,000 days each, each being 600 years. The fourth age ending in cataclysm at the end of a 432,000 year slash day period. But we really understand this was 432,000 days or precisely 12 centuries, 1200 years from the 3439 BC arrival of the Watchers to the Great Flood in 2239 BC, which completely obliterated their offspring. These four ages or 2400 years then began in 4639 BC. Counting backward yet another 600 years brings us to the year 5239 BC. We have no records outside a vague reference by Theopompus. 
He wrote of the ancient Zoroastrian belief in great world ages of 3,000 years involving a period where at the end a god is overthrown and another takes his place. And 3,000 years from 5239 BC is the great deluge date of 2239 BC when the watchers were confined and their offspring, offspring perished in the cataclysm. The god Azazel, presented in the rabbinical writings as a demon, was imprisoned. The Anunnaki chronology began in 5239 BC, counting 600 years to 4639 BC, then to 4039 BC when the moon appeared in the capture flood, then 600 more years to the arrival of the Anunnaki under Enki in the year 3439 BC. Zechariah Sitchin notes that the Sumerian cycle of 1800 years, which is exactly 600 times 3, was very important to the Anunnaki for astronomical reasons. This fact is found uh, enumerated in Flying Serpents and Dragons on page 57. 3439 BC was exactly the 1800th year of the Anunnaki Nur chronology of 600 year epics that began in 5239 BC. And Enoch of the Genesis narrative appears who is none other than the Enki of Sumerian text, a great benefactor to humanity. The appearance of the Watchers was 600 years before the birth of Noah during a dynasty of Anunnaki kings. Remember, in my Anunna files, I cite historical documents that relate that Noah's own family believed he was a child of the Watchers because he did not look like they did. 600 years later, this same Noah survives the deluge in the year 2239 BC, preserving the seed of humanity. In the first video, I demonstrated with many sources that it was the dating of the birth of Abram that allowed us to accurately date the Great Flood, and then confirm this dating by several sources. Now, it is again the birth of Abram, the Brahma of the Old World, born 1947 BC, that we further establish the precision of the Anunnaki nurse system of 600 year periods. Pre-flood and Anunnaki chronology are linked directly to the date of the Exodus itself. The Exodus story involves the escape from Egypt of the Israelites during a devastating cataclysm passed down to us as the Ten Plagues. Abram's 1947 BC birth allows us to date the Exodus to the year 1447 BC, for in the ancient text Cedar Olam, we have the Ten Plagues and Exodus event exactly 500 years after the birth of Abram. Redactionist author, highly controversial, Emmanuel Velikovsky in his book Ages and Chaos dates the Exodus to the year 1447 BC. In another famous book, Dr. Thiel of Mysterious Numbers of the Hebrew Kings dates the Exodus history to the year 1447 BC. And remarkably, United States cryptologist R.A. Boule, a former NSA, NSA officer, developed a system to study the numbers of the Bible and determined that the Exodus event had to have happened in the year of our calendar, 1447 B.C. And in one of my favorites that I cite frequently throughout my videos is Stephen Jones' research published in The Secrets of Time, where he uses the entire Old Testament, Book of Jasher, Book of Jubilees, the Assyrian eponyms, uh, some other uh, apocryphal and pseudo-epigraphical texts, and he derives the date and claims that the date for the Exodus in our calendar was 1447 BC, but in the Old World's calendar, it was 2448. The Book of Jasher chronology also has the Exodus event occurring in the year 2448. Archbishop James Usher, over 360 years ago, in his famous book, Annals of the World, also dated the Exodus event in the year of the Old World, 2448 Annus Mundi. From diverse sources, we find that the Exodus event was in 2448 of the Old World's calendar, while also being 1447 BC of our modern reckoning. 
Years ago, my penchant for reading books for which the principal tenets I disagree with paid off handsomely. In one such case, The Orion Prophecy, a book about the year 2012, which I had published my own book, Anunnaki Homeworld, showing that nothing was going to happen in 2012. But I had read several books that promoted the idea that something could very well happen attached to the Mayan long count. Now, one of those books was The Orion Prophecy, and in it, Patrick Gerald and Gino Radix, in this amazing book, discovered in Egyptian text, they published that they found a reference in old hieroglyphs to a number 2448, and it was specifically linked to the idea of cataclysm. Neither author knew that this was also the date for the Ten Plagues and the Exodus event under a different calendar. Hevelius, in his work, Cometographia in 1668 wrote that in the year of the world 2453 the Israelites escaped Egypt when a great disk appeared in the sky. This is cited by Emmanuel Velikovsky in Worlds in Collision. This is not bad, for Hevelius was not much of a chronologist, but he was only six years away from the true date, and this covering a 3,000 year period. Pretty impressive. Because the flood was the 1656th year, the year one of the old world's calendar had to be 3895 BC, which was 144 years after the capture flood in 4039 BC. 3895 BC is year one according to the biblical chronologist Stephen Jones in The Secrets of Time, who knew nothing about the Phoenix chronology, and in the Phoenix chronology, year one is also 3895 BC. He and others believe this began a 6,000 year period to the return of God to our world. This makes the year 2106 to be the year 6,000, or exactly 10 Anunnaki Nur periods of 600 year each since the year 1 of the pre-flood chronology, 3895 B.C. Remember, the concept of 600-year periods in antiquity was the appearance of a great personality. So who appears in 2106 AD? From year 1, 3895 BC, to the Exodus is 2448 years. 2448 is exactly one-third of 7,344 years. The entire history from the beginning of the Anunnaki Nur chronology in 5239 BC to the year 2106 AD, which is the 6,000th year of the Old World's timeline. This same 7,344 years, or 2448 times 3, is found in the sloping distant measurement of the Great Pyramid from beginning, the foundation, to the end, at the, at the apex, the chief cornerstone. The pyramid geometrical prophecy here relates that from the start of the Anunnaki chronology in 5239 BC to the 6,000th year of mankind's timeline in 2106 AD would pass 7,344 years or 2448 times 3. The sum 2448 denoting both a destruction and an exodus. This is a lot of data compressed into these two videos, but in all, this simple chart exhibits what we have learned in these two videos. 5239 BC, the Anunnaki Nur calendar of great years began a 3,000 year countdown to the Great Flood in 2239 BC and a 7,344 year timeline to the descent of the chief cornerstone in 2106 AD. 4039 BC was the capture flood, the appearance of our moon, Luna, which was long ago associated to the Anunnaki. This began a 144 year period to 3895 BC Phoenix Cataclysm, which marked year one of the pre flood calendar. This was 1200 Anunnaki chronology. 
In 1800 Anunnaki chronology, or 3439 BC, Enki appears with the Anunnaki and begins civilization among humans. A third of the world is destroyed in the Gihon Flood, the population center being in ancient Egypt. This begins 1200 years to the Great Flood, or 432,000 days on the 360-day Draconian pre-flood calendar. 600 years after the Gihon Flood, the hero Noah is born at the beginning of the Anunnaki dynasty of the Seven Kings. This is the first year of the pre-flood oppression. This is what the Exodus story truly mirrors. This is also remembered by Sumerians as occurring in ancient Egypt, not in Sumeria. In the 600th year of the life of Noah, according to the Genesis narrative, the Great Deluge destroyed the world in the year 2239 B.C. 500 years after the birth of Abram was the Exodus and 10 plagues over Egypt, which was 2448 Annus Mundi, or a third of the entire 7,344 years of the entire timeline from the beginning of the Anunnaki calendar in 5239 BC till the end of the human calendar in 2106 AD. This second video does not even constitute 1% of the chronological data that we will cover in this new Archaics 2.0 series. You can basically call me the last chronologist. I don't know anybody else doing this type of research or showing their findings. But we have 18.5 years to the coming of Phoenix, to the return of the vapor canopy in May, May 15th or May 16th, of the year 2040, depending upon what part of the world you live in. We have 24.9 years to the return of the Nemesis X object, which is coming in a future video. We will show exactly the calendrics on that as well. And to the 6,000th year of the timeline since man's banishment, not man's creation, we have 84.4 years to the return of the chief cornerstone, whoever that is whoever it is that built that giant prophecy in Egypt called the Great Pyramid. The chart you are looking at is the original pen and ink chart I drew in February 2005 and was the result of about a decade of research. The conclusion of this chart was that a pole shift was going to occur in 2046. You can see the pole shift illustrations at the bottom of the chart, the date of illustration and the 2046 date. The pentagram you see is a depiction of the ancient Sumerian concept called the Arab, a symbol used to describe when God breaks up the earth, a symbol found in Stonehenge geometry. This five-point star in cuneiform was called the Dingir, signifying a star in the sky and a god. The five-point geometry is made of ten angles of 108 degrees each, and I've shown in my presentations that this dates the building of the Great Pyramid of Giza to 1080 Annus Mundi, or our year 2815 BC. This chart was copied by a friend of mine, and she embarked on an email campaign in, the, in April 20, 2005, sending copies everywhere. Now, in January 2006, when I received a publishing contract for my book, Lost Scriptures of Giza, from Booktree of San Diego, I also received a letter from another friend with a copy of the November 2005 issue of Discover Magazine, one of the most prestigious scientific journals. I still have this copy in my studio today. The article in Discover did not cite the source of the 2046 date, but this is what it read. The internet has become a reliable source of unreliable urban myths, hoaxes, distortions, and mistakes. Many of the most historical postings warn of Armageddon-type encounters with comets or asteroids. The current doomsday craze warns of a deadly asteroid strike in 2046. Now, all these years, I believed that it was my chart that elicited this response from the editors of Discover. And it still might have been. Douglas Vogt, 
also pinpoints 2046 for the next pole shift, and he published this in a book in 2007. But we'll get to him in a moment. My own conclusion about 2046 was through analysis of the unfolding of historical events for which I claim have predictive value. At that time, I had no idea I would later discover an orbital pattern that led to 2046. And before any of you get triggered, everything in the sky is simulated. I recognize this. I know this. I'm getting a lot of guys from the flat earth community that are getting kind of disrespectful and I'm starting to block them from my channel. Seem to become the new fundamentalists. At one time, the, f the one time the flat earth community were the most open minded people around. They are now becoming the most closed minded fundamentalists, not realizing that the flat earth cosmology completely boxes in their entire, their entire uh, research. It's not, it's not a, a, uh, an end. It is a, it's a bridge to somewhere else. You need, it, these guys need to really take it to the next level, man, because flat earth, flat earth research is phenomenal. I'm on board. I'm sorry, though. I can't stop there. I've moved on. Anyway, but the periodicities, they're, they're, they're here for our instruction all throughout history. And this is where this video right here is going. Astrology has now entered my research radar, and I'm going to explain. My mathematical analysis of historical events and their patterning led to my discovery of cross calendrical parallels. The fact that the same year in totally different calendars has recorded within them identically of unfolding events. For example, see this chart. In the Old World calendar, the Annus Mundi system, in the year 2046, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed from the sky. In the book of Revelation, 11, 11, chapter 11, verse 8, the future civilization's capital is called Sodom. The 2046 Annus Mundi year for the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was a prophetic foreshadowing of the destruction of many cities in 2046 Anno Domini. To my delight, in my studies, I came upon the research of engineer David Davidson, who in the year 1926 published this chart of a geometrical calendar of the motion of the earth that will change in the year 2045. I show in my published materials that his calculation was one year off because he began his entire geometrical analysis for the year 4040 BC rather than the date 4039 BC that I have extensively demonstrated was the 600th year on the Anunnaki nerve system and important to a new movement of the earth called the capture of Luna. This research was conducted entirely independent of any knowledge of David Davidson's research. We came to our conclusions by totally different means. There are major isometric projections involving 2046, and these discoveries led to my next revelation. I found a perfect 792-year orbit that linked to major cataclysms in world history that were not attached to the Phoenix phenomenon and end with a next periodicity in 2046. This whole new pattern merely confirmed the many independent projections to 2046 that I had made years earlier and showed you in these charts. My book publishing all of these findings and more that are not even mentioned in my videos was titled Anunnaki Homeworld and was finished in 2010 and published in 2011. In the book, I explained that the Mayan long count could never have ended in the year 2012 and that the following year of 2012 would pass by without incident. There were hundreds of YouTube creators and authors who released their doomsaying 2012 books and videos. It should have been obvious that nothing would happen when the media embraced the idea so willingly and Hollywood as well. If the whole world believes something, it's usually a lie. Awaiting publication of Anunnaki Homeworld, I wrote two more bibli bibliography-packed books. Both were published by Booktree. Nostradamus and the Planets of Apocalypse is filled with new data showing a new date index code to the quatrains and how, in this code, the prophet provided detail-specific pole shift and world destruction prophecies for both the years 2040 and 2046. 
even specifying that the second would be far worse than the first. In the book is actual translations of Mother Shipton's poem referring to back-to-back -to -back cataclysms that would happen a century after a Second World War. You can't get more specific than that from a 500-year-old poem. This was released in 2013. Later, Return of the Fallen Ones was published with even more data on the timelines of the ancient world in 2046 dating a future cataclysm. Years after I released Lost Scriptures of Giza about the unknown history and secrets of the Great Pyramid, I finally returned to do much more intense analysis of the structure now that I had, a, had spent pretty much a decade going over the history of the world and constructing my chronicon. Using only the scientific measurements to a thousandth of an inch conducted by Sir Flinders Petrie, I was blown away to find that the major events in world history were all perfectly laid out in a rectilinear measurement of the structure, and that several researchers even hundreds of years ago already suspected but could not prove this. I have showed these in numerous videos, but last year in 2021, someone sent me a link to Douglas Vaught's YouTube video in introducing the research of the Diehold Foundation. This person told me that Vaught also predicted a pole shift in 2046. I was intrigued, and I did a search of everything I could find on his 2046 AD thesis. But this ended up being disappointing, for all roads led initially to 2018, and I couldn't find anything anywhere showing that Vaught had published his research sooner. Then I found a video clip. Here it is. Douglas Vaught first published the 2046 AD date in the year 2007. There's an 11th code system. It's not Moses. It was God's. And I found it by accident. And it's irrefutable what I found. But like I said, the Torah actually gives an exact drop dead date for this event, October 16, 2046. And that's dead center of when the next Gleisberg cycle will be, which is between September and December 2046. Now, when I wrote God's Day of Judgment, this was in chapter 11, and it was 2007. When I watched the entire presentation, I realized how people could easily misconstrue Vought's prediction. You see, the Diehold Foundation has a lot of scientific data on pole shifts and even publishes a 12,068 year cycle which is beyond anything in the historical record that can be verified. But the 2046 AD prediction for pole shift is derived solely from what he claims is a gematria code he found in the Bible. I can't say that he didn't find it, I'm pretty sure that he did, but many people have made comments and sent emails to me claiming that the Diehold Foundation has long been publishing the 2046 date based off of scientific data. I disagree. They have been publishing the 2046 date, I don't know if they've published it before 2007, but it's not scientific data. There is scientific data in the Diehold Foundation, but it doesn't produce a 2046 date. That was Gematria. I often say if something is going to occur, it will be seen from multiple different mathematical vantage points. His 2046 Gematria may indeed be true. If anyone can find any reference to Douglas Vaught's 2046 dating made prior to the year 2007, please send it to me. While it's not important, I am a creature of curiosity. My own research on 2046 is spread throughout several videos, and here is two of them from the Anuna Files playlist. And here is a high-resolution PDF chart I provide on Gumroad that also demonstrates the 2046 AD dating. The pentagram geometry is found in a lot of old architecture, traditions, and text. It is a five-pointed two-dimensional pattern that when rendered in three dimensions becomes a pyramid four base corners at the bottom and an apex at the top. Five points. So a few days ago, a longtime subscriber I have exchanged messages with from time to time simply asked me, Jason, you have an exact date for the Phoenix in 2040, so do you have one for the Nemesis X object in 2046? A simple question. And I answered yes. I explained that in many of my presentations, I say it is 6.5 years after the May 15th Phoenix event in 2040. 
The 2046 event will occur on the same day that in ancient times the whole world suffered something so terrible that even after, ever afterward, it was remembered as the Day of the Dead. It is November 1st, All Hallows' Eve. In the ancient systems, the night always preceded the day. Thus, Halloween on October 31st, after sunset, is actually November 1st. Two days later, Victoria sent me this. Using the Placidus system for midnight, November 1st, 2046, Giza time. Then she cleaned up the background noise on this astrology chart, chart to produce these alignments for this date. Victoria was surprised to find this symmetry and has already begun finding similar amazing patterns in other past dates when the Nemesis X object and when Phoenix visited. This is an entirely new field of study and I admit I am unqualified to conduct it. And I, I also maintain my own trajectory and it's going in a different direction. I have too much data yet to reveal to be sidetracked with this whole new avenue of learning that would, that would I, I would have to immerse into. So I'm calling on astrologers to simply back check all the Nemesis X dates and the Phoenix dates I provide in my charts. Every Phoenix date is May 15th. Every Nemesis date is November 1st. All the year dates are easily found in my charts. I wanted to share this despite the fact that I am basically unable to carry out this avenue of research myself. If anyone is just curious about the chronologies, the, the links are in Gumroad. The gum, all the charts were provided in Gumroad before. There's over 350 of them for just a couple bucks. Uh, I am I am really interested in somebody following through on this because I know that there are more hidden messages in here because these messages are attached to the planets, the houses of the stars, and individual stars that are significant in those houses. I have read Henry Cornelius Agrippa and Francis Barrett, the Magus, and so many others, and I understand like the fascination in the Middle Ages with the trigons and the hidden encoded astronomical messages that are in there. I know that some of you astrologers can look at these dates and you can find things uh, that are relevant between the meanings of the planets and the meanings of the principal stars that, that are found in these configurations. So I'm, at, I'm calling on astrologers to uh, join in the Archaics research. Can't do it all by myself. And uh, if you guys are interested in the charts, they're in the Gumroad sections below. I remember John of Archaics has asked a very intriguing question. Why would Zechariah Sitchin publish false information? Why would he publicize a theory that he knew was an error? We're going to answer that in this video. We're going to do that tonight. For those of you who are Sitchinites, who believe everything that Zechariah Sitchin publishes is the absolute gospel truth, you're probably going to get your feelings hurt tonight. But it's a video you need to watch nonetheless. This is Archaics.com. So we can all agree that Zechariah Sitchin's Earth Chronicle series is wildly successful. We can all agree that it's very tantalizing. It is interesting. And that he's a best-selling author. He says, combining... All of these facts does not at all mean that the narrative that he, he puts forth is true. There are a lot of people who dislike my research. There are a lot of people who really, really like Zechariah Sitchin. And I understand the books are fantastic. But these same individuals have never read David Hatcher Childress, Maureen Gallery Kovacs, Hans Bellamy, Emmanuel Velikovsky, Gerald Massey of the 1880s, Samuel Noah Kramer. There are many big names. There are many, many scholars who have studied Sumerian antiquities. Zechariah Sitchin is not the only one who can translate it. And as a matter of fact, there are many Sumerian translators who don't believe Zechariah Sitchin can really accurately translate the Sumerian pictographs, the logograms, the, even the later cuneiform. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, I promise that was not a COVID-19 cough. Listen, Zechariah Sitchin's research is, is, is fascinating. 1976, the first book came out. You have to take it into context. Zechariah Sitchin was trying to break into a market at the time that was wildly crazy with ufology, alien theory, 
it was the 1970s. We had, we had seen the rise of Jacques Vallée. We had seen the rise of the 1947 Roswell incident. We had seen the rise since 1962 of UFOs, encounters of the third kind, actual human-alien interaction. Zechariah Sitchin sought a place in that demographic. He sought a place trying to break into a realm of literary success that Ver Eric Von Daniken was reaching at that time. Eric Von Daniken paved the way. Chariots of the Gods is absolutely fantastic. And nowhere does Eric Von Daniken need to arbitrarily affix descriptions and interpretations to Sumerian words that don't exist. Eric Von Daniken's research is very interesting. He believes in the ancient alien theory. He believes 100% that the Earth has been visited multiple times. He believes, as Sitchin does, but his evidence is culled from far different sources. Zechariah Sitchin first began with interpreting Sumerian texts to put forth his theories. But before him... Nibiru and its identity was already uh it was already a debate among scholars in in you know astrologers and magicians of babylon a book published in 1903 or 1904 i have a copy in my library i even cited a few times in some of my articles and posts and maybe even one of my books anunnaki homeworld but scholars are arguing over the existence of two objects one is the pen pn deity which caused all kinds of massive destructions in the ancient world, and later on the Greeks called it Phoenix. And the other was Nibiru, which was a source of, it, it was a source of controversy. It means the fairy, it play, it, and it appears at the crossing, the crossover, but absolutely no arithmetic, no calendrical mathematics, no orbital history has ever been found in any Sumerian, Elamite, Ugaritic, Egyptian, ancient Israelite, Ionian, Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian text. Nothing. It is entirely an invention of Zechariah Sitchin. His 3,600 year theory for the orbit of Nibiru was arbitrarily taken from the Sumerian Shar dating. Ten Shars is 3,600 days. Zechariah Sitchin, I would like to be able to tell you made honest mistakes, but he totally omitted the scholarship of prior centuries and even millennia. Even in interpreting Atlantis, even interpreting the 9,500 year of Atlantis, pushing it back to a date that is absolutely impossible because the Atlanteans could have never been at war with Greeks who didn't exist at the time. Even the Greek histories only push back their histories to the days of Ogyges. And, and it is well attested in many ancient chronographical texts that the Ogygian flood was only the 16th or 17th century BC. There is no way, there is no place for an Atlantis way back in 9,500 BC, which Graham Hancock and Andrew Collins and so many popular authors are all trying to push this date back of a younger Dryas period, an arbitrary falsified ice age that never happened. Even the flora and the fauna that thrived during this Ice Age fiction has now been affirmatively shown by paleobiologists. They know, they know for a fact and have published study after study after study showing that the woolly mammoths, the woolly rhinos, the giant tree sloths, all these flora and fauna from the Ice Age Younger Dryas period, they lived in a jungle to temperate area. Mammoths in, in, in Siberia have been found with buttercups undigested on their tongues. It's impossible. This ice age is BS. The establishment has known it for a long time, but they allow these authors to push these false narratives because anything is acceptable as long as they don't publish the truth. Zechariah Sitchin did not offend the establishment, so his books became wildly successful. He was allowed to mistranslate a word, and many scholars of the day laughed at his research, and when, when the stairway to heaven came out, they, they didn't even entertain it. 
there is absolutely no way that you can take any cognates or any Sumerian logograms and translate them to rocket ship. It does not work. The word is Shem, Shamu. <coughs> Zechariah Sitchin, in order to make his narrative work, his fiction, his spaceship chronologies work, had to affix the interpretation rocket ship to the word shim. But in every instance that word appears, it only has two meanings. And it's found all throughout the Old Testament in many Semitic writings. That meaning is either name, as in I will make you a great name in the earth, a great shim. Well, what happened every time a significant event occurred in the Old Testament? What happened when somebody important died? What happened when two men entered into an accord, two nations, a peace, a peace agreement? They built a monument. And the word Shem that Zechariah Sitchin has translated over and over and over as rocket ship from the Sumerian, which was later passed on into the Akkadian and the Ugaritic and the Canaanite in the Hebrew, in the Israelite, and then the Ionian, is simply monument. Over and over and over, when it's talking about moving and receiving materials from somewhere else, going up and down from the stars, Shem is found over and over in Zechariah's, Zechariah Sitchin's writings, and he says rocket ships are going up and down, but that's not what, the, that's not what these ancient texts are conveying. They are conveying that a monument, a shim, was on this planet, somewhere on the surface of this world, and it was used to convey materials up and down from the sky. Whatever that monument was, or where, wherever it is today, is up for you to decide. But it's a very interesting scenario. We have, we have with Zechariah Sitchin, the accusation of intellectual dishonesty. We can't maintain the veracity of his writings and, 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 and claim with any honesty that Zechariah Sitchin did not intentionally set out to deceive. And the reason we say this is his arithmetic is absolutely false, and he knew it. Zechariah Sitchin was, is probably way more well-read than I am. My own personal bibliography in my library is now over 1,300 nonfiction reference works, and I cite every single one of them in my published books. But Zechariah Sitchin has read way more than me. I have no academic credentials. I am only a man of immense curiosity and great memory. But Zechariah Sitchin had read the exact same Sanskrit translations that I have. He has read the Bhagavad Gita, the Mahabharata, the Puranas, he has read the Rig Veda. He has read so many commentaries on the Haggadoth and many other Talmudic texts. So he knew that his 4,332,000 shards was not 4,332,000 years. His Anunnaki history did not stretch, stretch to almost half a million years. He did that to make his narrative work. But nothing that happened 432,000 years ago would have any historical relevance to anything happening later. It's too long a period of time. No personalities would have existed. Even if someone was to have lived that long, would they still be the same person 432,000 years later? Would they still be relevant to whoever they were biologically, cerebrally, even spiritually, to who they were when that time period began half a million years earlier? No, it's, it, it's inconceivable. But the answer lies in the Vedic texts. The Vedic texts describe it was 1,200 years, and that 1,200 years was 430,200 days. The math is perfect, because the ancient draconian year was 360 days. 360 turnings is 360 shars, just like the book of Genesis describes. And the evening and the morning was the first day. And the evening and the morning was the seventh day. And God said that it was good. Zechariah Sitchin knew his shars were turnings. He even alludes to it in his own writings, to the doubt that he had many times over that his own chronologies were in error. 
but he pushed forth anyway. When his first book came out, it was a challenge. It was basically a challenge to the academic community to start looking at the Sumerian records from a whole new perspective. But the problem is, is you're going to take if you want people to peer review your material and take you seriously, you need to be more honest about how you translate your words and how you fit your narratives into a chronological scheme. Chronology is my expertise. My 510 page chronicon is free to the entire world on archaics.com and I challenge anybody, anybody to look at it and see any errors in my adding a 41 different calendars forward and backward in time to put together a synthetic history of the world that lasts over 5,600 years. All my other books rely on that chronology. I change no dates. And most of the dates all come from other sources. The history of the world is easily recorded if you leave the establishment positions alone and you go straight to the specialist literature and put the narrative together yourself. It all fits together perfectly. We have with Zechariah Sitchin a false, a pseudo-history backed up by pseudoscience, completely backed up by publishers who saw a sensation and they overmarketed it. And they've got all these people believing in these great, fantastic Anunnaki histories when they were only compressed within a 12th century period. The seven king, the seven kings of the Anunnaki who ruled before the flood, the Nephilim dynasty of seven kings is on the Sumerian prism king list, and it's 241,000 char, 200 shars. 241,200 shars is the length of the seven kings of the Anunnaki who collapsed the old world and caused the gods to flood the world and destroy humanity and everything they had built. Well, 241,200 is really easy period of time because in other historical narratives we find out that the seven wicked dragon kings of the old world only ruled for 600 years but in the Sumerian king list if we affix the term turning a day and a night to the shar then 241,200 becomes 670 years, and seven kings can definitely rule in a, in a dynasty for 670 years. This is what we have with Zechariah Sitchin, absolute deceit. A seven king dynasty did not rule for 241,200 years, and he knew it, but he had already published book one, so he continued with the narrative in book two, and then in book three, and then book four. The Earth Chronicles from Book 1 puts forth a totally falsified chronology and then sticks with it. It's ridiculous, really. But, there, but some good has come out of it. It has opened people's eyes. I encourage you to divorce yourselves from the theories of Zechariah Sitchin and look deeper. Because we have Sumerians who recorded the, appear, the first appearance of the Anunnaki, and it's not like what Zechariah Sitchin said. It was a new race that appeared that was tall, alabaster-skinned, sky-eyed like white or emerald-eyed. They appeared and they were astonishing. They were like wizards. They had technology. Their infrastructure was absolutely intact. They appeared among a short-statured, smooth-skinned, dark-haired, and dark-eyed race. The Sumerians, the descendants of the Ubeids. The Ubeids were a very short-statured people, very kin to the people of the Urimbaba Valley of South America. Dark hair, dark eyed, straight hair, smooth skin, smooth skin, short stature. And suddenly, a fleet of vessels they had never seen before landed on their shores. Not spaceships, wooden ships, but they had technology. They had tablets they carried in little bags that allowed them, allowed them. And these bags have been seen all over the ancient world on reliefs from Egypt, all the Sumer and Ugarit, the Hittites in South America, Central America, the Kimu people. These little bags are found everywhere. And they contained the operating systems to vast equipment that could move stone and build, build roads and monuments. And it was basically their tablets. Their tablets control everything. It's where the ancient scribes from the ancient world even got the idea of putting cuneiform on a clay tablet to preserve knowledge because it was a physical memory of the technological tablets that these, these people had. Remember, in my prior posts, I show you definitive evidence that the human race 
can go from horse and buggy to Hadron Collider in just 200 years. Do you have any idea how many times we have been reset? How many times the historical narrative has been falsified so you would believe in a linear projection of uniformitarian view that we have evolved from these little hairy primate monkeys and become the people we are today in a linear projection under uniformistic views. It's bullshit. Every bit of it's bullshit. Railroad tracks and machine tracks have been found all over this planet, almost petrified in stone. Malta was once covered with them. The Great Pyramid in Egypt is also a technolithic artifact. Not only were machines required to build it, but it was a machine itself. I like Zechariah Sitchin's research, and I do not want to denigrate a man who has now left us. He has, he has moved and exited this program to become whatever it is he became. He moved on. He has passed away. But I'm personally, but I'm personally connected to him as well. My publisher, Book Tree in San Diego, Paul Tice, used to be Zechariah Sitchin's personal videographer. I have an archive of Zechariah Sitchin photos nobody else has. I've posted a couple before. They're in with some of my videos. Paul Tice traveled the world with Zechariah Sitchin, and he loves that man. And I, and I, I hate to be the bearer of information. I am a Sitchin critic. I believe 100% in the Anunnaki. I believe 100% in the Anunnaki histories, but they are not as Sitchin presented. Their truth is fascinating, and he didn't have to lie to make it interesting. It's far more intriguing than the deceptions that he passed off. He made mistakes. He might not have been genuine lies, but once he realized he had made the mistakes, he continued to perpetuate them. He didn't want to change. David Hatcher Childress has written books that have even more evidence of the Anunnaki of the ancient world without ever mentioning the Anunnaki. All the evidence that Zechariah Sitchin uses is new to the public because Zechariah Sitchin has increased increased learning from a whole pool of people that were never interested in these topics before. So that's where the advantage lies. But the proof is that other writers, like David Hatcher Childress, I, I'm very impressed with his Lost Cities series. Huge books, like eight or nine of them. Uh, these books are fascinating because he goes from continent to continent showing you all the archaeological anomalies that cannot be, cannot, cannot be explained without really offering a lot of theories about how they were done, just showing you that they're there. Of course, Eric Von Daniken had done the exact same thing, but, Eric, but Daniken has put out many, many books on the ancient alien theory. All of these men are taking all this evidence that humans have had very sophisticated, technologically advanced civilizations on this planet multiple times. Many times we have attained a level of sophistication and many times we have been reset. The truth is actually harrowing and most people don't want to receive it. People are so angry at the elite and at the establishment and at, at, at the orders that, so of which the Masons are but a finger on a fist. They're so angry, but they don't realize why these organizations exist and what they truly fear. As long as the majority of humanity is kept in ignorance, as long as a dark age can be, can be foisted upon the people, as long as enlightenment cannot be obtained or be pushed back. As long as deceits and paradigms that are untrue be, be pushed upon the people's educational uh, uh, organizations or, or schools or whatever, as, as long as humans never come into contact with the truth, the elite remain in control. The elite lose control when the majority begins to become enlightened. But the problem is far more complex than that. The elite know of a mechanism that is in existence, a very curious property about our world. It is the Phoenix phenomenon. It is the apex of my research. The Phoenix phenomenon only activates when humans have reached a level of sophistication and enlightenment that the elite can no longer maintain a control over or exercise any authority over. The phoenix activates and sets everybody back. 
The elite are not a part of the censorship system. They are not a part of the Phoenix system. They are aware about it because in ancient times, they had fallen victim to it many times. And they had created organizations that would keep humanity dull because there are governors all around the world hidden in our sky that monitor all human affairs. And when we become a threat, the system reboots. Phoenix is activated. We are basically effed off in volcanic resurfacing and tsunamis, tidal waves, gamma ray bursts. All these things are disguised to make us believe that they are natural phenomena when they are not. They are absolutely induced by technology far more fantastic than we possess. But before we go in, before I digress and go into other topics and subject matters that should be the subject matters of other videos, John, your question about Zechariah Sitchin is very is a very simple answer. The man, the man had published his book during a time when everybody was making a killing publishing books on alien theory. Eric von Daniken had started something. The Earth Chronicles Book 1 was fantastic, and the Anunnaki was a raging success. But the problem is, is Samuel Noah Kramer, Maureen Gallery Kovacs, so many other Sumerian translators had already been translating these texts. They did not see any of this that Zechariah Sitchin saw. So much creative license was, was employed in the promulgation of his theories that we can actually call Sitchin a liar on many of the things that he translated. Nibiru does not in any way infer a planet. It was a phenomenon during a major fleet crossing of ships that left a cataclysm-torn region and showed up on the shores where the Sumerians first came into contact with them. The Anunnaki were a race of Caucasians, tall, white-skinned, blue-eyed, nothing like the short-statured, dark-haired, dark-eyed people who had no written language, hardly no traditions, were living as animals at the time. These Caucasians came with an entire history intact from another area of this world that had been destroyed in much the same vein as before them, the Cro-Magnon, who we have been told by establishment were just primitives, very hardly one step above Neanderthals. But it's not the truth. The Cro-Magnon were very sophisticated. They were very intelligent. And they had lost their entire infrastructure after a major world cataclysm. In Chronicon, you'll see much evidence of the Anunnaki and the true chronology of the Anuna, the Anunnaki, the later Anakim, their descendants, the Rephaim and Zamzumans and the Zumum giants documented throughout the Old Testament and how they, they later ended up in the British Isles as the Fomori and the Fomorians. Uh, the Zechariah Sitchin should be applauded for his immense research. He did put together a fantastic series of books. He did make genuine discoveries about the Great Pyramid that I have not found in other other writers' books, some that I have mentioned in my videos. Um, but Sitchin's translations, like the rocket ship and the shim, and his, his deliberate, he, del, it, and it is deliberate, you cannot claim that Anunnaki history was 432,000 years from their descent to the earth to the great flood destruction. When you have that access and you even cite the very ancient Sanskrit and Vedic sources in your other books that concern other ancient nuclear wars. Yes, nuclear wars are in the Mahabharata. Yes, the ancient Vedic texts do talk about atomic weapons in the past. Flying machines, there are even Sanskrit. There, China is in, is in possession right now of uh, old Sanskrit books uh, that were flying manuals. Not only how, but even pre-flight procedures and all that. So, it's very interesting. But what we have with Sitchin is intellectual dishonesty. Instead of publishing that he was wrong and re retweaking his chronologies, he didn't want to do that because then he would offend the uniformitarian view. The great scientific authorities that claimed that everything had to have happened in hundreds of thousands of years, that none of these things could have happened in an abbreviated period of time of 12 centuries. Zechariah Sitchin 
Great Earth Chronicles, great books. Totally inaccurate. Yes, the Anunnaki existed. Were they from another planet? Absolutely not. Were they from a war? Were they from a war-torn cataclysm, disappeared Atlantis? Perhaps. Did they arrive on a fleet of ships? Absolutely. Were they Caucasians? One hundred percent. The black-headed people. That's what the Sumerians called themselves. Absolutely venerated them, and even said that the chief characteristics of the gods was that they had a beard on their face. So, John, I hope I answered your question. In the 1890s, yes, scholars already knew about Nibiru. They already they already knew about the word Shem. That uh, the Zechariah Sitchin didn't invent that, but he did mistranslate a whole lot to put forth his theory. And once he began mistranslating, it just became easier and easier and easier. And that is why today not one Sumerian Akkadian scholar has backed Zechariah Sitchin, not one. And they won't. The man was a publishing sensation. But our world has always put forth fictions as fact. It's what we do. My publisher, Paul Tice, traveled the world with Zechariah Sitchin. They were personal friends. At the time, Mr. Tice was a videographer, and he traveled with Sitchin to uh, Hattusas. And I have a I have a record. I have a collection of photos that my publisher gave me. Uh, he and Sitchin traveling all over the world together, because that's what they did. Now, I am a Sitchin critic, as many of my followers know, especially those who have followed all 230-something of my videos. My publisher and I are, are at odds about this. It's not something we openly discuss, but he's not really comfortable with the fact that I am anti-Sitchin. However, I do promote a lot of Sitchin's ideas because they were correct, but there needs to be made a distinction. You see, the Anunnaki phenomenon has turned what appear to be perfectly rational people into subjects of massive suspension of disbelief. Now, suspension of disbelief is what is necessary for someone to accept everything else as real. Many people who have read Zechariah Sitchin actually believe that the Sumerians only 5,000 years ago, writing on clay tablets, recorded historical events about what happened 450,000 years earlier. To believe this narrative, they have accepted that these Anunnaki figures themselves lived for 50 to 100,000 years long. So when I state, excuse me, but you do know that in all the representations and reliefs in ancient Sumerian and Babylonian iconography that the, Sumer the Anunnaki are always shown as bearded, right? I'm always met with silence. So the gods, the gods are bearded. That's cool. I can accept that. I personally cannot take serious Seriously, anyone who claims to have a modicum of education and yet tries to explain to me how people lived for tens of thousands of years. We have absolutely no ancient records of anybody living for long periods of time until the first century BC. We have a, we have a, few, a few mentions here and there of people living 215 years, something like that. But let me tell you something. We don't have anything like hundreds of thousands of years. In fact, even the Genesis account, which can't date earlier than the 3rd century BC, only mentions people living up to 900 and something years. So, and, and their lifespans rapidly decreased. So, I just, it's very difficult for me. But the book of Enki is just like the Bible. It's a work of fiction written by Jews. Now, there are no references in any Near Eastern texts or traditions of drop ships, capital ships, aircraft. Not one Near Eastern text can be produced by anyone that states that any group of gods or people came from a place called Nibiru or dropped from the sky. Those texts do not exist. They are inferred. If you are of the opinion that 5,000 years ago, writing on clay tablets could have recorded anything that had happened 450,000 years previous, 
then you can be made to believe in anything. Your Netflix version of history will conform to every turn you need it to to suspend your disbelief. You are a cultist, accepting unprovable and absolutely preposterous ideas as facts. You may as well cite your sources as Nickelodeon. And don't get angry at me. I did not present this series of falsehoods so as to convince you of their veracity. No, that was Zechariah Sitchin. You see... It's quite common in the generation of a cult following to first lay down a foundation of facts supported by suppositions that the lies are then mortared into. It is embarrassing to me to entertain these comments on Facebook, YouTube, uh, from people who can't get, they can't get through that wall of cognitive dissonance and think for themselves rather than follow these false templates of misinformation. Sitchin's books are good, and they cite real, actual archaeological finds and discoveries. But then the leap is made that what's come from underground had somehow derived from the Anunnaki from space. I am dumbfounded that my fellow supposedly free-thinking human brothers and sisters could believe these fictions about happenings hundreds of thousands of years ago. Here's a fact right here. There are no human writings found anywhere on earth that date before 3500 BC. But what does that mean? It means that you believe that over 400,000 years passed with no written records until all of a sudden some people decided to record elaborate epics, transactions, rosters, king lists, syllabuses, star catalogs, and the histories of the gods that appeared half a million years earlier. That's what you believe. Now, because this is your belief, you are not a historian. You're a religionist, particularly a cultist. Now, if you're offended, let's explore this. Why should what I'm saying to you right now make you angry? If you're a follower of Sitchin, then many of you are mad as hell right now. You don't even know why, but I do. Your conscious mind has accepted a series of, of concepts that's true, but your subconscious mind is at complete war with these conclusions. Anger is the result. It's an outward manifestation of internal conflict. I'm not attacking your belief that there were figures in ancient times called Anuna, who, who later in Babylon, after they had vanished, were called Anunnaki. I'm not attacking that. I'm not claiming this is untrue. I am not saying that these Anuna were not technologically advanced. I am not saying that the Sumerians did not regard these Anuna as gods. I'm not making these claims at all. I'm not arguing against that. I am not saying that everything Sitchin published is wrong. Calm down. I am a chronologist. I'm probably one of the last of my kind. I can and will defend the integrity of my chronographical studies with more sources than you're probably willing to follow. And I've done so in 230 videos on Facebook, six published books, maybe seven. Well, maybe my seventh book is also chronographical. I have, I have many published books, but I have hundreds of posts on Facebook, and they're free. You don't have to pay anything. Go check them out. 230 videos are free. So, Zechariah Sitchin has erred in promoting Anunnaki history as it is purposely intended by him to be aligned with the anthropological theory of human development over hundreds of thousands of years. You Sitchinites so often claim the Sumerians said their gods did such and such hundreds of thousands of years ago, but it's not true. Translators said that. The original Sumerians did not. Now, you see, the Sumerian sex adjustable system was based off of 60 and 60 times 6, which is 360, like 360 degrees of a perfect circle. The same as the Olmec calendar, the exact same as the Mayan long count calendar, the exact same as the Vedic system. All the yugas are all divided by 360 evenly. So is the Mayan Bactin divided perfectly by 360. Listen, where we find it's just, it's phenomenal how all these cal calendrical systems align perfectly and they appear at the exact same time in history, but you believe the Sumerian one is somehow different. When you are done following fairy tales and want to review the real Anuna history, I have 30 videos in the Anuna files that will educate you on the real history and future of the Anuna. 
But if you keep to your faith that people used to live for 50,000 years, or that the Sumerian mathematics were somehow different than the Vedic and the Mayan, or that people 5,000 years ago knew things that happened 500,000 years back and decided these histories needed to be recorded on clay tablets, well then, that's a tenet of your faith. I can't argue that. I'm just, I'm just not in your cult. My friends, this is Jason with Archaics. There are some really deceptive cats out there that would have you believe so many different untenable theories. But we're here to set that straight. Very short video, straight to the point. One man in the ancient world, Eudosus of Nidos, he told the truth. There were many others that followed who also revealed the truth, but it was too late. The establishment theories were set as far back as Plato, who totally misinterpreted what Solon was telling him. Ancient calendars were unlike the calendars of today. The concept of a year had no value. Time was measured in units of days and months. Enjoy this video straight to the point, but we're going to set the record straight. I know that most of you, my listeners, have not read the 510-page Chronicon, which solves in chronological order so many mysteries of the past. So I'm going to share with you in this video a secret. I have read Posidonius, Crantor, Ovid, Lucretius, Herodotus, Pliny the Elder, Diodorus Siculus, Thucydides, Hesiod, and many more besides. This is why I know Graham Hancock, Zechariah Sitchin, and many other authors who claim Atlantis, the Deluge of Noah, and the Great Pyramid do not date back to 10,000 BC. These authors use as their evidence the fact that the Egyptian Turin Papyrus reads that the gods reigned 23,200 years before Shimsu Hor. This is in the message from the Sphinx. The, the Sphinx. Uh, Andrew Collins is among these authors. The Turin Papyrus reads that Thoth ruled 3,126 years. The Turin Papyrus also reads that Horus ruled 300 years, the last fully divine king. Manatho, a Greek in, in, uh, of Egypt, wrote that the gods of Egypt reigned 13,900 years. The demigods after them reigned 11,025 years, these being called the Shimsu Hor, the children of the sun. George Sincellus wrote of six gods or six dynasties of gods who reigned 11,985 years. Diodorus wrote, that the entire history of Egypt from the reign of the gods to the last mortal king of Egypt was exactly 23,000 years. The gods and the Shimsu Hor ruled for a little less than 18,000 years of this 23,000 year period, mortals ruling for only about 5,000 years. Even Plato claimed the Egyptians told Solon that Atlantis and Greece dated back 9,000 years from his time which was 8,000 years older than the Achaeans that founded Greece. A critic of the pretended antiquity of Egypt was a contemporary of Plato. His name was Eudoxus of Nidos, who wrote, The Egyptians reckon a month as a year. This is a key to almost every single Bronze Age chronological system. Sir Isaac Newton, in his own exhaustive work titled The Chronology of Ancient Kingdoms on page 103, wrote concerning the lies of the Egyptian priests. After Cambyses had carried away the records of Egypt, the priests were daily feigning new kings to make their gods and nation look more ancient. A month as a year. Diodorus Siculus wrote that it was a popular in antiquity to reckon the year by the lunar cycle. The ancient Frisian Oralind manuscript reads that before the Great Flood Cataclysm, quote, the years were not counted, unquote. 
This is why the oldest dating systems are in the hundreds of thousands of days. The Sumerian records, the King's List, the Vedic, the, o the Olmec, the early Egyptian, the Mayan Temple of the Cross, the Mayan Long Count calendars, every single one of them share the same common denominator that the units of time that were measured were days and that years had no significance. It was the turning of the stellosphere, and they did not reckon the years. Even the entire 241,200 Shar timeline of the seven kings of Sumer is only 670 years. It's 241,200 divided by 360. 360 days, which made up a unit, which we call today a year. Although post-cataclysm, it is 365.25 days now that make up this year. When we take heed to this fact and divide the large sums given by ancient authors as periods of history by months, we get datable events that all fit within a perfect chronological history of events from the year 4039 BC to the year 2239 BC in the month of May when every civilization on this planet suffered a reset known, known popularly as the Great Flood, but known by many other civilizations by other names. Chronicon and its supplemental notes are the proof. These authors are sensationalist liars. They have read the same text as I. They knew these large sums were days and months. Calendar codes used by priests, not years. This simply means the timelines for the Anunnaki, the Great Pyramid, for the civilization, not the city, the civilization of Atlantis, in these popular books claiming extraordinary dates of 10,000 and 12,000 BC are based off of fictions the fantasies of these authors. All of recorded human history fits a demonstrable chronology of about 6,400 total years. Chronicon may be worth your time. On archaics.com, the Chronicon 510 pages are free to the public. They are PDF downloads. Feel free to download them. There are also 750 pages of supplemental chronological notes. It's all free to the public. I will never sell that book. It's yours free, just look. There's no excuse for not knowing. You just learned in this video one single fact that should remove tens of thousands of books from the shelves all around the world. But it's not going to happen because the establishment has a vested interest in having you believe in untenable theories. When we apply the single fact that was revealed by Diodorus Siculus and by Eudosus of Nidos, that these calendars, the common denominator between all of them is that they measure time in units of either days or lunations or months. These weren't years the Egyptians were talking about. Graham Hancock is a very learned man, and so was Andrew Collins, so was Robert Schock, and so many authors before them. They knew better. They had read the same materials I read, but it wouldn't support their untenable theories. They want an Atlantis, a great pyramid. They want this younger, driest period of super civilization that existed in 10,000 BC. They want an idea, an ideal that archaeology and history just doesn't support. The textual archaeological record is very clear. All the civilizations of our world, all the calendars of our world, if measured properly, all show that the entire modern human experience um, from the written word timekeeping systems it's all compressed within a five, six thousand year period it's all here these these books will be continue to be sold and there will be publishers who will continually push them but it's not the truth these civilizations these 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 in vast amounts of time they they take they take on they become amorphous it's like Zechariah Sitchin's belief that the Anunnaki descended 432,000 years before the Great Flood. It's so ridiculous. A Great Flood would not even have any meaning or any correlate with an event that happened 432,000 years earlier. There were many Great Floods in that period of time in Earth history. It's 432,000 shars, which is turnings, the stellosphere, which is only 1,200 years.
And there are so many mysteries in the ancient world that are easily comprehended by just using the calendars that those civilizations possessed and not any interpretations in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s that has been imposed upon those systems that the original authors did not want to convey.